This is Lizzie from Let Zoe Spoil You and Sagira from Sagira Salutes You. And together we are Newbie versus Weeaboo. Sagira, Newbie. Lizzie, a Weeaboo. It's, it's Newbie, newbie versus, versus Weeaboo. Ahoy. Heidi, hi. Hello. It's us again. Back in your earlobes. Hi. <laughs> it sounds really random. Is that, are we parasites now? We didn't get to the brain, we stuck at the earlobe. We're just stuck in the earlobe, being a little earworm, an ear booger. <laughs> but yes, we're getting a quick segue today into our episode of Parasite. <laughs> ah. It's just Game of Thrones in anime, isn't it? It's... <laughs> A little tragic, yeah. Things are getting a little, a little tragic. It's, it's just like so many death flags, so many death flags. No, no, it's going to be fine. It's like no, this is anime. Anime is not afraid to kill off characters that you've gotten to know. Like there do is no get, way out. Exactly. Do not get attached to anyone because they will just break your heart. It's like ugh, fine. Yeah. <laughs> and especially at the moment when you feel for them the most. Like the minute that yeah. you're like, oh, they've grown on you. Oh, I see it. Oh, I feel bad for you. I'm actually kind of like a bit invested. Oh dear. <laughs> you did <laughs> your troubles are over oh yes but uh let's do a recap of the last episode because it does go into this one but we have just found that it's kind of becoming more public knowledge of the parasites and they've invented a new way of greeting each other which is to pull out a hair from your head or from someone else's head and if it moves then that's a parasite and if it doesn't then you need to I don't know, get a scalp massage or something because that's to pull out hair. <laughs> but then this episode, which is episode 11, The Bluebird. I still haven't worked out why it's called that. I just got that song. What's it? Bluebird singing in the death. Sycamore tree. No, no, in the death of the night. <laughs> take my heart and something. Bluebird. Blah, 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 blah. I don't know. I can't thing- sing. It's a good thing you don't know songs nor the rhythm because otherwise we'll get copyright infringement. I know. I'm like tone deaf. It's like I was humming anime themes at Luke the other day and he was like, what are you singing? I'm like, it's Record of Loros War. He's like, how the hell is that? And I'm like, oh. Oh dear. <laughs> I know sing good. <laughs> or hum. Or, yeah. It's, you, you sing beautifully for you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the best at singing the way I sing. You're the best person who sings on that couch. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, Luke can sing. <laughs> well, he's not, he's not sat there right now. No, so, <laughs> anyway, totally off topic. <laughs> this episode opens with um, it's nighttime, and there's a drunk girl with a well-to-do dude accompanying her, like very mismatched uh, coupling. But of course, it's a mismatched coupling because we can tell that the guy is not normal no. <laughs> as they are they have the starey eyes yes she asks him if he knows about the hair pulling greeting and in her drunkenness yanks out his hair which a is rude to start with you don't just pull out people's hair but b the wrong move anyway because the hair is alive it's alive <laughs> it's in the little snakes like they got the little mouths going ma 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 at the end you're like oh my god that's creepy it is a bit rank but then, okay, so normally I would say that the sub version, what they say, is better than the dub version. But in this instance, I think dub wins because in the sub, the guy says, you embarrass me. In the dub, he says, this is awkward. <laughs> and I was like, it is a little bit awkward. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is awkward is very much a Western thing. A Japanese person yes. wouldn't say it. <laughs> so it's it's more of the fact that someone can be an embarrassment to you. It's, it's far more, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I understand. But it would amuse me just, oh, this is awkward. <laughs> it's like, oh, yep. <laughs> but then there's a bang or a loud noise. And then we have another woman who's walking through the park and she sees the man dragging his drunken victim away. He's, they kind of stare at each other for a minute and he's like, would you like to join me? <laughs> and they have a lovely romantic dinner in the park. <laughs> da, 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 da. We then cut to Kanna. Kanna is in a beautiful meadow, but the music is very foreboding. So it's like, <laughs> this isn't all what it seems. And then the sky turns red and mutants start to dig their way out of the ground. And uh, she... That's the sound of... That's the sound of... You know, blobby and creepy mutants. But she runs, as you would, and one catches her. But then she looks up to see her hero riding its mutant steed. Why is the steed a mutant? I don't know. <laughs> parasites! She's got parasites on the brain. Yes, but 
the steed could just be a steed. It doesn't have to be a no, mutant no, steed. It's a creepy world of creepy. <sighs> well, it's Sunichi. Hooray, Sunichi. And he cuts down the foes. He looks very grown up at this point. He looks like a proper man. <laughs> like hero man. He holds a Kana who is naked. And now he's naked and he's holding her in his arms. And it's all very loving. And they're about to kiss. And then she wakes up. Oh. Which I would think was very frustrating. <laughs> yes. I mean, what I'm always amused about by this scene is that it's clearly kind of like parodying or taking inspiration from a manga called Berserk. Mm-hmm. Like, because the art style shifts slightly and they look a little bit more like the Berserk characters. And Berserk is like this really like violent fantasy scene in manga. And it's all like weird mutant monsters and and getting their heads chopped off very brutally and like you know women having a not very nice time but you know guts coming in and slurring everything and you know people being naked and it's just like so that's what it reminds me of i'm just like he's got all the extra shading work and they're like square or harsher lines on his features like how berserk looks and all the mutants are like oh those could have just walked straight out of a berserk manga so that's a nice little easter egg for berserk fans as well yeah. then that's cool at school, Kana is reading the news on her phone that Hideo was the one who did the school massacre. And then she thinks back to Sunichi saying how the bad guys are the ones giving out the wavelengths and that's what she can sense. So this gets her thinking, obviously, that, you know, she sensed Hideo and he turned out to be a parasite. So if she senses Sunichi, what does that mean it's like you know what it means lady yeah. you're just not admitting to it yeah. you're not stupid but you're a little bit smitten exactly she doesn't want to give in to the fact that the boy that she likes could be a gross mutaty thing yeah. she sees sunichi and attempts to pull out his hair but without looking he catches her because obviously he can sense things like that because his, his senses are heightened and he's like, if you want a hair, just ask. And he pulls out a hair and gives it to her, which is really good for Sunichi, the fact that, you know, he can do that. The fact that they've said, like, oh, it's all in the face. And it's like, not really. No, there are <laughs> ones that don't have a head parasites. No, nope, there's many a parasite in other parts of the body. So he's like, there you go. That, that's fine. So he walks off. And then as he leaves, she gets out a tissue from her bag and then puts it in the tissue, the hair, and then puts it in her bag. And it's really creepy and obsessive. And it's yes. like, girl. <laughs> oh, you've gone from smitten to like, you're a little obsessed, but you know, you go do you. Which is kind of, I mean, like, she was such a strong woman character. And now she's like this obsessed little girl. And I didn't like the shift in that. I, I get like there's a lot more to it, but yeah. You know, it's like, no, she's strong and independent. Don't make her be all lovey and, oh, I love you. I'll do anything for you, weird mutating boy that I can't get over. She asked Sunichi if he knew what Hideo was before he had warned her, because obviously if he's warning about it, then he must have an inkling. But he says no, because he's smarter than that to admit that he knows <laughs> what's going on. He contemplates telling Kana about Miggy, but Miggy convinces him otherwise. Yeah, he's like, uh, <laughs> shush now. <laughs> he's like, don't tell anyone. I want to tell her. No. He questions Kana about the telepathy and tells her not to act on it in case she finds a monster, which she had done a couple of times. Yeah. She sees no problem and she will just pull out her hair. <laughs> she's like, it's fine. And Sunichi is not her cool with this. He's like, do not do that. Do not go around <laughs> pulling people's hair. <laughs> these things are more dangerous than you if you pull out the hair and it just suddenly goes chomp th- that's exactly. it exactly i mean a if they're in a private place and she does it it's going to kill her and b like there's there are parasites out there that have just chomped without caring who's around yeah because they're all differently um evolved so she might pick the wrong one who's not quite as evolved as the others and get chomped in public so you know and also if she pulls out the hair and they and it wiggles and she's like, oh, my God, it's a parasite. Then they know her face. Yeah. And she doesn't know that they can mutate now. They can change their features. So they'll just change their feature and then come get her later. Yes, there's many a problem with just <laughs> pulling out people's hair. It makes her happy that he cares so much about her, of course. I mean, he cares about everyone, but she's like, oh, I'm so special. But Miggy, with his creepy tiny mouth that comes out, oh, it's no. like, boop, boop, boop. I'm like, no, Miggy. <laughs> But he whispers that he needs to speak to Sunichi. So they leave. And Murano is behind Kana 
and she's heard this whole thing and she's all upset. Yeah. But they go off and have a chat anyway. They go have some girly time. It's like, well done, Morano, for like, you know, going, actually, she wants to know what this girl's intentions are because, you know, she wants to face it head on. But also the fact she's getting closer to Shinichi, she's got another person that she can ask about, about him. About, are you really Shinichi? Yes, exactly. Um, we cut to Shinichi and Miggy having a chat and Miggy does not want Shinichi talking to Kana as their relationship could be dangerous. It could put Kana in danger, it could put them in danger. They don't know what her intentions are. She might go off and tell Mitsuo. Like They have no idea what motivation is behind knowing. Kana and Murano have a girl talk. Murano asks if Kana thinks Shinichi act- is acting weird from when she first met him. Kano is more interested in their relationship and let's slip that she dreams about him. She's like, oh, do you dream about him too? And I'm <laughs> Arden. <laughs> it's like, uh, excuse me? But Kano is pleased that Murano is unsure of Sunichi and she thinks that she still has a chance. She can still get in there. No girl. Uh, <laughs> You're too much of a danger to the like, boy. Yeah. She's all like, oh, I like the Shinichi that I see now. And Murano's mm. hung up on the Shinichi he used to be. Like, obviously, like, you know, his taste might change too. And I'm I'm the woman for this new Shinichi. Some random street and a car pulls up. A guy in short shorts gets out of the car. <laughs> yeah. It's like a gym outfit, but it's very tight, like, short yeah, shorts. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like, like the colleague is like, do you really want to go out in that? Not embarrassing? And he's like, no, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm going to go out in my hot pants. Well, he goes to a building and he's confronted by the bouncer there. The place seems to belong to the Yakuza, yeah. who is the uh, Japanese mafia. The bouncer goes to punch the guy, but instead gets his head smooshed into a wall. And I mean smooshed. Like, pfft, like, yeah. oh. <laughs> that is your brain obliterated. Yes, there is no coming back from that one. So Short Shorts walks into the building because he's now got access. He busts some heads with his brute strength. And as the gang attacks, he takes them out one by one by using his speed and massive muscles, yeah. like massive muscles. I don't know if it's because of the guy he chose or if he's manipulated the muscles to become bigger because they were saying, weren't they, that um, that the parasites have sentient muscles. Yeah, so they can like check, that's how they all turn all like and wiggly stuff. But most mm. of them shouldn't be able to manipulate their full body it should only be the head that's doing it so i think he was already a pretty tough guy but okay. again he's got a lot more agility for a guy that has a head parasite alone and also he does all of this without changing his head parasite he's literally just jumping about smooshing things so mm. a little bit more like Sh- shinichi does also it's, it's cool watching him just be like and i stab you and i'm just using my hand as a sword to slice you all in half and the yakuza are like ha ha i've stabbed you with a sword and he's like one i smoosh you i've shot you two i smoosh you and it's just like oh you stand no chance he's like three hits oh, i got three injuries but that's not too bad a test but yeah it is a massacre those yakuza guys go down it really is it's just bloodbath in there one guy manages to get his sword in his arm but the muscle itself breaks off the sword and the muscle throws it back. And that's the bit where I'm like, sentient muscle? Yeah. The muscle is throwing the sword now. But then Short Shorts gets shot in the leg, as you said. And finally, he hits a sword in the head. He's unaffected. And the last guy, the last Yakuza standing, asks him what's going on. And the parasite says it's an experiment to see how successful they would be against a heavily armed gang. Slice. And then the last guy goes down. Yeah. They're testing the waters in case they have to go up against police and military. Mm-hmm. And it would seem, I, yeah, I mean, who better to choose than the Yakuza, who are yeah. like the most notoriously badass <laughs> mafia in <laughs> Japan. Outside, a group gathers round uh, the smashed head guy. And when Short Shorts appears, they run after him. It's like, you've just seen what he's done to this man. Why are you chasing? <laughs> it's like, just call the police and be like, uh, we just saw a guy leave a building covered in blood and there's a smooshed head here. Don't go, get him! It's like, do you think you're going to be able to do that? Run away. <laughs> you go, smooshed head guy, we shouldn't be around here. Look, this is the building. Let's get out of here. Call the police and they can go figure it out while I stay over here safe with my face unseen. <laughs> But they run after him and they go around the corner and Short Shorts has disappeared. He's vanished into the thin air. Now, while they are wondering where he went, the creepiest yeah. thing happens. <laughs> so I have a huge thing about... Infi- I, I 
they do this on purpose because I'm sure more than just me think it. But I have a huge thing about when there's something going on in the foreground and they don't know what's happening in the background, especially when it's dangerous. Like if like a mannequin is lying there and it suddenly just gets up and starts walking yeah. towards like, Basically things like the that. trope of every horror film ever. Oh, yeah. They're like, oh, we're having a nice conversation in the background. They're like, you know, the killer just sits up again. Or it's yeah. like it's picked off one of their friends, but they're looking the other way. But it's when it's done silently. Yeah. And there's just no noise to it and oh well, yeah but yeah so what happens here is that a bloodied hand comes down from the top of the screen really slowly and then just yanks the guy at the back and pulls him away and it's just because you don't expect it yeah you don't expect this bloody hand just, <laughs> just like, pa -ping! <laughs> but yeah i was really like oh oh no <laughs> So parasites still upsetting and creeping people out. Yeah, and also the two guys have been chatting and looking that direction, and they just decide to continue their journey. So they don't even look behind to see if the other guy is still there. They're just like, no, let's let's just leave now. Well, because of the way they're all dressed, I assume that they're not all together. I assume no. that they're just three blokes who stumbled upon this thing, or two of them are friends and the other guy. So if the other guy left, they wouldn't notice or they wouldn't care because they don't know him. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah. But then, they, as you said, they walk off and then the parasite comes out, but he's now the guy that he just took. So he's now dressed as a business guy. He gets back into the car and he's like, the driver's like, you look different. He's like, well, no shit, Sherlock. You're in a full suit now rather than short shorts. Exactly. And then they drive away. At school, Yuko, Murano and Sinichi, they are reading about the mass murder that has just happened. So Muse is travelling quickly now of things that are happening. Sinichi doubts that it was a parasite that did the mass murder, as they would only do it if they needed to feed. Oh dear, Sinichi! Yeah. <laughs> kind of giving away <laughs> trade secrets there, boy. Well, it's more than the fact that it's like he doesn't know what the parasites are up to, because like they, they keep as we, they keep evolving, they keep changing. But Sinichi's not in the loop, though he's got a parasite. Yeah. Miggy doesn't know what's going on because everyone that meets Miggy wants to kill them because yeah. they're abominations to the parasite. So, yeah, he has no idea that they are now moving on to... The next just phase, protect, yeah. yeah. Just protecting themselves in general rather than just there to eat. So, yeah, it's not good. We're in an office or an apartment or something. I'm not sure where we are, but there's a man watching the news. He meets the two parasites from the car, saying it was a bit much. <laughs> it was like, a <laughs> bit too much killing, isn't it? But the one who did the killings responds with, it was a good exercise. <laughs> it was. You are successful. Yeah. And also it can be like, you know, written off as just like turf war. Cut to town and Sinichi and Murano meet for a date. I mean, it seems like a date, but, you know, they're not quite dating yet. They're still very close friends. They end up in a cafe and they think back to the school murders and Murano says that she's having trouble sleeping. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, she saw a lot. She saw an awful lot and she went through a lot. And, yeah, I'd, I'd probably become an insomniac after that because yeah. every time you I close your I could eyes, go to school again. I'd become a hikikimori. A uh, hikikimori? Oh, a uh, shut-in. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, they're the, the race of Japanese teenagers that just refuse to go to school and live in their bedrooms. Well, they might have had like good lives. I don't know. Might have worked out for some of them, maybe. Really good World of Warcraft players. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that, that kind of happens. But after a while, they can't be reintroduced to society. So they have to be rehabilitated. Otherwise, they oh. don't get jobs. Well, we have those here as well. So it's not just in Japan. We just well, yeah, it's not. But the Hikikimori thing is like, it's a massive social problem. There's like special houses that they get moved to so they can learn how to interact with society. Because it's not just they don't go out, as in they never leave their room. because And because of their age and stuff, they live in their parents' houses because you live with your parents until you're like married. So the parents have to like still like feed them and stuff. And they can get, they get very antisocial. There's a tendency towards violence because they don't want to be moved and don't want to listen to anyone and don't want to talk. Yeah, and then they can stay there up until like they're 30. And then they, obviously they've lost their education. They haven't got a job. The parents don't know what to do because they can't look after them forever because, you know, the parents are getting older. <sighs> Trouble everywhere. Sunichi says that a friend, friend told him to think of people as cows and pigs. 
It doesn't seem so bad as we eat cows and pigs all the time. And it's like, no. It's like, oh. be eaten as normal. You've been spending too much time with Meggie, Shinichi. That's a friend. Mm. Friend. Like, hand friend. But uh, Murano says maybe his friend is the one that's changing him. You don't know how on the nose you are, Murano. <laughs> smart cookie, but yeah. She questions about his trip to see his dad, but he abruptly stands up and leaves and she follows. Obviously, it's just so he does not want to talk about too much to tell her. Yeah. So, I mean, you can't tell that story without either lying or missing out a lot of the story. And also, make- he doesn't cry, so he can't tell the story because he won't be able to show emotion over it. And it's it's going to look so just like disconcerting and strange to tell the story of your mother's death without even tearing up as slightly. Or even having any emotion behind it, because he could still tell the story and like not cry because he could like you could reason that he's all cried out. But yeah, you you still get some hint of emotion, like you say. But yeah, he's very logical now, and it's very hard to do that. Outside, they find a puppy. Now my heart sank for a second because I was like, no, she's never <laughs> <a> puppy, <no." laughs> oh, the puppies and kitties in this series don't go well. Like, um, it's a quite a high death rate amongst dogs in particular, actually. Oh, oh, but it was okay. It was there was no doggy death at this point. I was like, okay, phew. And basically, Morano wants to hug the puppy, but then it is joined by its protective mother, and that's the end of that bit. Is just showing another mother. Yeah, protect him over her child. They sit on a bench and they see a young boy crying and want his mum to wait. He calls her stupid and that he wants her to die. And it's like, wow, child. How <laughs> yeah. are you? Blimey. Like, I get like, I hate you because kids, like, you know, they yeah. don't understand the power of words. But I want you to die? It's like, like whoa. I mean, you can tell child. that obviously the mum's struggling. So they're from a struggling home. So it's not having the best of lives, I don't think. Maybe there's an mm. absent father figure or something. Well, after that, she raises her hand to hit him. And when Sunichi sees this, he starts to think of his own mother. That causes his heart to hurt. And he doubles over and he's like in pain and he's struggling. But while that's happening, the mother stops herself and takes the boy home. So obviously she thinks better of it. Yeah. It's like, well, you in know, what? honestly, that child deserves a slap for telling you to die. But, you know, yeah. but when we do not, um, we do not promote hitting children. <laughs> children no, <laughs> That's true. We do not promote it. However, as a cartoon, yeah. it's like that child was stepping the mark, I think. Yeah. But the mum, she was very good for seeing for what it was. The child tired and frustrated and it getting on her nerves because she's clearly tired and frustrated and going, no, the best thing to do is to embrace him and then continue their journey home. It's like, yes. well done. Well, Morano is worried about Sinichi, as you would be when your friend doubled over having a mini heart attack. And she asks if he's okay. And he starts saying that there's a hole. It's the hole in his heart that's doing it. Of course, she has no clue what he's talking about. But he shakes it off and makes a joke that he's just being old. And it's like, no, no. <laughs> You're 17. <laughs> You're 17 and you've just had a mini heart, heart attack, panic attack. You've yeah. had something that's clearly not right. And you're just going, oh, it's fine. I'm just old. It's like, no. <laughs> you can't do that to your friend. Like, you can't worry your friend like that and then like, just laugh uh-huh. it off. No, it's not funny. Well, he walks home with Murano telling us that, telling us that he feels more connected to Miggy and how much he ca- and how much in general he cares for Murano. Like it's nice that he's still got that caring side of him that he still cares for a person, because obviously Miggy only cares about himself. Yeah. And if Miggy had totally taken over Sinichi, then Sinichi wouldn't care about Murano, but he does. He really yeah. loves her, so it's he has good that he's still got that feelings for her. Yes, it's good that he's still got that um, humanity about him. When he's with her, he wishes that Miggy would stay asleep forever. Well, it's probably because Morano is the thing that's keeping him grounded and yeah. giving him that um, humanity. And he wants to feel that all the time. Kind of senses him. She's around and she senses him. But as she gets to him, she sees them kissing. And she's obviously hurt and disappointed because she thought she had a chance. It's like, no, no. <laughs> they have a history. You've just met the dude. <laughs> so Nietzsche leaves and once again, she asks if it is him. At this time, Morano cries because she doubts 
she doubts that it is still him because she consents all these changes and she yeah. she doesn't feel like she can trust him because no. he keeps saying yes I'm still me but it's like well clearly you're not you clearly there's something happening and it's upsetting her because it's not the boy she fell in love with no and also that he won't share any of her and she's like she's desperately wishes that she had got closer to him sooner because then maybe he would have opened up to her by now and she feels like she's lost that chance to really know him at Kanna's house at night she's looking at Sinichi's picture on her phone and then she makes a call Daytime, Sinichi is on the train and Miggy asks, why is he making such an effort to see her? <laughs> her being Kana. That's what the phone call was. Sinichi says that she, she said it's her last favour to ask. While they wait in town, Miggy senses five parasites nearby. They are amongst the crowd and there is now eight of them. So it keeps going up. It's like, oh my God, there's five, there's eight, there's twelve. They're <laughs> congregating. All of the other parasites are finding each other now. They realise that the people that they can sense are the parasites are up on top of a bus and they're giving some sort of speech. And then we realise that it's a campaign to be mayor. Mm-hmm. Oh no, they're finding power. Oh yeah. no. <laughs> Not only are the parasites organising and like becoming more intelligent, they have found another way to ensure their safety by, you know, taking control. Once again, Miggy is like, do not make eye contact, do not let them see you, but... Sinichi makes eye contact because that's what Sinichi does and the one that he makes contact with it it doesn't seem interested right now it doesn't really care about that it's got bigger things on its mind like making parasites mayor Miggy says it's best to leave let's just get out of here before stuff goes down (laughs) Sinichi tells us that the parasite is running for mayor so that's how we know but then Kana appears and Sinichi isn't happy with anything that's happening at this point in no, time. It's like things are not going well. And that's where that episode ends. <laughs> See, we only have one episode where it ended okay, which was the last episode. Yeah. And now it's gone back to, oh, no. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Things, things are not good. Things are not good. <laughs> it's all going wrong. But let's move on to episode 12, which is called Kokoro. Why? <laughs> What does Kokoro mean? I don't know. I've realised Bluebird was the wrong thing. I was thinking of Blackbird. It's Blackbird <laughs> singing in the deep of night. Kurt sings it in glee. So it's like it wasn't a Bluebird. I don't know why that episode is called Bluebird. And... I don't know why it was called Bluebird. I don't know why this one is called Kokoro. If someone can tell us, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's some research that could be done, but I didn't do it. Well, this one once again opens with Kana's sexy dream. And that's all we have to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> in Sinichi's room, him and Miggy are talking about how unlikely it is that they will get a parasite as a mayor. <laughs> <Fool. laughs> but they think that this is due to if they don't understand the human psychology. So if they don't know how to get people to vote for them, then they're not going to be able to become mayor. Yeah. But they're organised. They're evolving. They know more than you think. Miggy thinks if Ryoko is involved, the plan may work because she's the most intelligent one that they've met so far. Yeah. Sinichi detects Miggy's interest in the topic. So he cuts him off by asking if they're doing it because they're after something. And Miggy thinks, yes, they are definitely after something. Yeah. Like, why would you become mayor if, they, if it's not for a good reason? He thinks that one reason they could be doing this, after studying humans, the parasites could have a real interest in politics. They might just really <laughs> love politics and, you know, want to get involved in global warming and, you know, <laughs> poverty and all that stuff. They just want to sort things out. In this case, he'd be a good mayor. Yeah. <laughs> and Sunichi thinks that's dumb. He's like, no. 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 <laughs> they haven't suddenly decided, you know what's really interesting about humanity? The politics system, you know. <laughs> I really love politics. The other reason that he may want to be the mayor is to secure a safe haven and a food source for parasites, which is more likely yes. to what they would want. If they are in control, then they are much more likely to be able to cover up murders, get away with stuff and just be like, I was thinking about it. I'm like, you would totally just go into prisons where there's death row inmates and be like, right, today you die by parasite dinner. Um, yum, 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 yum. <laughs> but also, like, they can change it to be like, oh, yes, our top scientists have 
found out that it's not the hair you need to pull, it's the nails. You need to cut people's nails. And of course, like this got nothing to do with the parasite in yep. the nails. So they cut the nail and be completely safe. So they could make up a new yep. thing that they found out that just isn't true. So Shinichi thinks that if they keep eating people and they're going, oh, yeah, it's just missing people. It's, you know, it's nothing to do with parasites. Then they will start to be more of an uproar because it's like, well, why are these people going missing? What, yeah. If they're not being eaten, what's happening to them? Especially if someone famous goes yeah. missing. <laughs> if suddenly a celebrity disappears, the world will be like very like, oh my goodness, all eyes on this. Exactly. So they can't just make people missing and then go, oh, it's not the parasites. Okay, well, what is it then? We don't know. <laughs> so either way, it's not good. Miggy makes a good point that the mayor could control the situation and change the information, like we just said. So Miggy's already onto that. Sort of, yeah, the mayor can do what he wants if he's in power. We flash back to Kana's meeting with Sinichi, so where the last episode finished. And she tells him that she can sense more than just him, about four or five of them. So she's saying, like, I can sense more people than just you. As she couldn't sense all of them, because there was eight then she's not as powerful as a parasite, but the whole thing is very dangerous. So it's like, okay, so you can't sense all of them, but you sense something. <laughs> Miggy expands into a giant eye back in the bedroom. I know. <laughs> <laughs> He's just a massive eye. And he wants to know what Sunichi is thinking. Sunichi says he is entitled to his own thoughts. And Miggy says he was just concerned for some reason. <laughs> but of course, Miggy is on to Sunichi. He knows that Sunichi wants to tell someone. So he's looking at him with a giant eye. <laughs> yeah, okay. Hmm. You are being scrutinised, boy. <laughs> yes. You're being watched. In town, Sunichi looks at a campaign poster, which Miggy says he cannot win this fight. He's like, this is bigger than you, Sunichi. This is beyond us. Sunichi just wants to know how many parasites there are, which Miggy says is impossible. It's like, I cannot sense every single one because there's so many now, which is not good. No. They walk around and Sunichi bumps into Kana, this girl. <laughs> <laughs> they go to a quiet park to talk about her special abilities. Sunichi warns her again to stay away and she again suspects him. Mitsuo arrives, so Sunichi leaves. <laughs> It's like, hi, bye. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I was just like, no, come back. Oh. Just, just let me out of here. I feel like this is not the place I need to be right now. Kana tries to stop Sunichi, but Sunichi says that he needs to talk more to her, so he'll text her later. Kana says that she'll sense him, but he reminds her that it could be someone else. And Mitsuo is very confused by this whole exchange. <laughs> He's like, what do you mean you need to talk to her? What do you mean you'll text her? What, what do you mean you can sense him? What? I don't understand. <laughs> So it's something to do with you. Go away. <laughs> At home, Miggy is concerned why Sunichi wants to talk to Kana. And he requests that Sunichi doesn't put him at risk. He says he has no sympathy and again threatens to kill someone if Sunichi tells. So he's just reiterating, I'm still me. Okay. I, no matter how much you've evolved and how much you care for these people, I'm still a parasite. I still do not care about your friends and family. Just to make it clear. <laughs> Kana's house and she's obsessing over what Sunichi wants to talk about as you would be if you were in love with a boy and he's like I need to talk to you like, oh he loves me back <laughs> she senses someone and goes to investigate and it's night time outside she finds a suspicious woman who's very much the parasite yeah. and she runs from her she's like you're not normal bye bye <laughs> yeah thank goodness well done Kana just walk away from this situation <laughs> She receives a text from Sunichi and then it cuts to an abandoned building where they meet. Sunichi smacks his hand very hard to find out if Miggy is asleep. Can you imagine Miggy wasn't asleep? <laughs> what are you what? doing? <laughs> what the hell? I mean, it works either way for Sunichi because either he smacks his hand and Miggy's asleep so he can talk freely or he smacks his hand and Miggy's awake and Miggy will react So and then show himself to Kana. So either way, it works out well for Sunichi. But he was asleep. Uh, he goes on to tell Kana his story. And Kana is not impressed. <laughs> she doesn't fully believe him and she wants proof. She thinks he's getting rid of her for Murano. So it's like, do not come near me. I've got a parasite. Things will get dangerous for you because you can sense me. She's like, well, you know what? You're just doing this to push me away because you and Murano are a thing. You know that we could be a thing. And you're trying to protect Murano. 
Kano tells Sunichi that he gives off a different signal from the monsters. So if it's not him, she will be safe and they don't need to stop seeing each other. Now, we know from the scene before that that's a lie. Yeah. Is it, no, Kana, don't lie about this. Just, oh, no, it's a mistake. Exactly, because she's just gone out thinking that she's sensing him and she met a woman in the street. And it's like, you know, if you hadn't run quick enough, you would have been food. So why are you putting yourself in this much danger for this boy? He's just told you everything. Like, What more do you want? She wants him to someday show her Miggy and he promises that he will. Sunichi's house, and he and Miggy read that the parasite won the election. <laughs> we have a parasite mayor. Oh, dear. Sunichi thinks back to his conversation with Kana, and he starts to doubt what she's saying. She, he starts to doubt that she can actually tell a difference. So he's now maybe regretting what he's done because, you know, she's pushing so hard for them to still be friends, but now there's a mayor, and that means there'll be more parasites, and she'll be in more danger, and... <laughs> Sunichi and Murano are walking together, arranging a date, and Kana is stalking them. <laughs> Girl! This is the Kana show at the moment. It's like all about her right now. So Kana thinks that her and Sunichi are tied together more than Murano is because Murano can't sense Sunichi like she can. But we know that Murano can. Yeah. Murano has got that ability. It's just that she's not telling people like Kana is. Well, Kana's telling Sunichi. And hers but... isn't as strong and hasn't started like evolving but she comes but kind of comes out and she starts like really concentrating going notice me notice me like she really wants to need to turn around and see her just from her throwing out these waves but it's not sanichi that would sense her it's miggy and miggy does miggy yeah. sees her you're like oh, oh. Mm-hmm. and they walk away and Mitsuo arrives because, and he says, like, you're being a creepy stalker. And she's like, who's stalking who here? Because <laughs> he's like, following her. <laughs> kind of feel bad for Mitsuo at this point. I'm like, oh, he has no idea why his girl is suddenly like just like off. And it's like, what? what? I used to be the main squeeze. I don't get it. <laughs> I was your bad boy. Now you're going after this guy. But he, what he doesn't understand is why she wants Sunichi if he wants someone else. Because he's clearly with Murano and it's like, well, you're chasing someone who doesn't want you. And uh, she says, get lost. She's go away. I don't want to hear this. And he's hurt and he leaves. Yeah. She says that she's really cruel to him. I mean, yeah. at least she does say that, like, sorry, that was a bit harsh. And I was like, really? That's a bit low, you know. Yeah. It was like your main squeeze and was doing your bidding for a bit. Sunichi's house, and Miggy wants to talk to Sunichi in case he tries to talk to Kana while he's asleep. Miggy's not dumb. <laughs> <laughs> he says Kana is getting stronger and now emitting her own signal, because that's what he was sensing. It's the same one that the parasites send out, and Miggy sensed her on the way home. Sunichi is shocked by this, going, oh no, now the other parasites will be able to sense her, and they will eat her. No! Because obviously if she sent that parasite... Um, wavelength yeah. and then they find her and they go oh you're not a parasite you're a human nom 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 nom, nom, nom. <laughs> miggy thinks it will only work when she's focused and and it's only like a certain range limit that will be able to do it so she's not as strong but she's still stronger than a normal human so Nietzsche tells miggy that he told kind of everything <laughs> And he wants miggy to show himself as she didn't believe him and miggy's just like looking at him like what <laughs> Miggy is not happy, even without emotion. He is not impressed. He's like, nope. <laughs> yeah, he, at first he says, no. And then, like, Sunichi does his little, like, charming, convincing. And in the end, he's like, okay, fine. Kana is back at the abandoned building at night and she's writing Sunichi's name on the wall. Yeah. And now we've got to the point of total obsession. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> like, you know, Sunichi loves Kana. It's like writing it on walls. It's like, oh, mm-hmm. dear. In town, Sunichi asks if Miggy is keeping his promise of showing himself, but then they sense two parasites coming. And as this was the area that he was going to meet Kana, he calls her and says that they need to move where they're meeting because obviously it's dangerous in that area. Sunichi wants to see if the parasites sense him. Uh, so he like hangs up on her and hangs around for a little bit, but they don't seem to be interested right now. Yeah. So parasites have something else on their mind rather yeah. than these stupid hybrids that didn't make it to the brain no they're like we've got bigger fish to fry now we can mm. deal with you later meanwhile kana takes her he- 
takes the hair that she took from Sunichi and she wraps it around her finger. And she wants to prove that she will only sense him. She doesn't she she doesn't need to sense anyone else. She she's so tied to this boy and she's now got his DNA on her finger and it's like, you know what? We will find each other. Yeah, because it symbolises the thread of fate that they believe in, that two people are connected by destiny by a thread that's tied around their, like, index finger to each other. Yeah. You said this in um, the um, Madoka one with the yeah. red ribbon. Yeah. yeah. Same thing. She wants him to sense her back, so she goes out, <laughs> and it starts to snow. In town, Sinichi tries to call Kana, but she's left her phone at home because she's like, no, we don't need phones. We can find each other yeah. through our senses. Oh, Kana. <laughs> he wants Miggy to find her, her signal, but there's too many people. Like, It's like, how am I supposed to find this one person when there's parasites walking all over the place? It's like, <laughs> it's like, it's like oh, dear. Oh, it's all going a bit peaked on. It really is. It's all ramping up now, isn't it? Kana thinks she's found Sinichi and goes back to the abandoned building. We know he's not there, so she has found something else. He's still wandering around town, and Miggy now senses another parasite, and Sinichi's worried that it, this is what Kana is following. I mean, the building must be pretty close, because... Yeah. If, also, if, Shinichi can go pretty damn fast. Yeah, but what I mean is uh, that Miggy can only sense 300 metres, so yeah. it must be closer Just than we think it is. I think, yeah. Kana enters the building to find a parasite eating someone. It's pleased to see her, obviously. Oh, free food. Yum, yum, yum. <laughs> and as she tries to escape, it wounds her. And she is convinced that liking her dreams, Sinichi will save her. And he does. He arrives. And then and she's, yeah. and she's impaled. No. It's like he turns up, his hand is all ready to go. And she's all like, it's coming true. My dream is coming true. It's all going to be amazing. He's there. Oh, and the other parasite. Like, Slash. Plop. Sunichi, seeing this, tells Miggy to handle the defence. And Miggy's like, the defence? And he runs at them. And he runs at the parasite and he smashes his hand through and he pulls out the beating heart, killing the parasite. And it's that such a force that he sends him through a brick wall. Yeah. And it's like, wow, he mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, whoo. I don't think we've seen Shinichi this angry yet. That's no. proper like total disregard for the other's life like an instant kill kind of like whoo that was brutal Kano. they inspect Kana, but miggy says that she's lost too much blood she's in his arms and she tells him that this was her dream because it was because she was lying in his arms and she's like i'm so embarrassed to tell you and it's like oh and then she dies <sighs> and then sunichi looks up and sees his name written on the wall yeah. and it's like oh <laughs> It's so sad. She doesn't. De she didn't deserve no, that. Anna did deserve not deserve it. that death. No, not at all. I'd actually forgotten but, about it. I mean, I'd forgotten how, like, it's only the midway point that it happens. I thought Anna lasted longer. So mm -hmm. rewatching it, I was like, really? Is a death scene coming up already? I thought they they did more. No, no, goosh. But it. She doesn't deserve it. But at the same time, it shows that that danger that Miggy kept talking about, like it's true. It's yeah. you can't have these relationships with these people because they will eventually get in trouble and die. Yeah. So it's a very good. Um... It's, it's heartbreaking. But at the same time, it's realistic. Yes. Like, exactly. Her behavior was just like you can't you can't survive something like that. Her naivety in her just like her willingness to believe a connection forced mm. her into a situation where she got killed. Well, we skip to Kana's funeral and there's two inspectors, I assume. They are talking about Sinichi and how calm he seems at a funeral, especially since he was the one that found Kana and called the police. They talk of how his mother was killed by a parasite and as he was found with the body and the dead parasite, they asked him to provide a hair because they were like, well, there's a dead parasite. How did that happen and there's a dead girl here what so are you but of course Sinichi can provide that and he's not a parasite Sinichi wishes he went to the movies with Murano instead of meeting Kano because if that had happened I mean it may still well have happened because yeah. Kano was so obsessed at this point whether they were meeting or not she would have gone out to try and find him she would have been running around the street sending off signals exactly so I think that it doesn't matter what had happened at this point yeah she was too far gone and Miggy uh, says that it was just a matter of time. So we all agree. Mitsuo finds Sunichi alone 
And he punches Shinichi in the face, as you do at a funeral. And he's asking, why didn't he protect her? And then he beats him up, asking why he's not crying. And he says that he's not human. Well, Shinichi agrees with this and he pushes him back. And what I really like about this ending is that the credit music starts. Yeah. And then the credits start rolling over this. And it's like, it, I don't know, just add something to it to have that music in the background while this, because it's such calm music yeah. and it's something so violent happening on screen because Sinichi's screaming at him saying, like, I'm not human. And he punches him in the face and his yeah. nose is pouring with blood. And it's like, whoa. So, yeah, it's not a, not a good scene at all. But he realises that he has to stop himself because if he carries on, he will kill him. Yeah. So he just walks away from the situation. He's like, this guy's been through too much. We're both angry. I'm just going to leave. So, yeah, Sunichi, when he's alone, he agrees that he's not human and he still can't understand why he's so calm and why he's not crying. He, I think he does know, but he doesn't want to admit. No, it's, it's hard to admit that your humanity is getting lost. And that, yeah, you're no longer quite, yeah, human. He thinks Miggy is taking over his brain. So he starts continuously hitting his head against the tree. And Miggy stops and he's like, Sneetchy, stop. He's now bleeding. And he says, at least my blood is still red for now. And that's the end of that episode. One of, like, one of the, oh. the nice bits of symbolism is the way the blood falls makes it look like he's crying. And it's like mm. the only way he can shed tears is to shed his own blood. And that's as close as he can get to showing emotion and shedding tears. Sad episode. It is tragic. I do have to admit, I did kind of know that Kana was going to die because when I look up people's names, I go onto a wiki and I didn't realise that there was a deceased wiki and it has all the list of the names of all the people that were going to die. Oh, luckily, no. luckily, I haven't looked at any other name because I was looking for Kana specifically. Don't look so, up anything no, no, no. while watching this series. I oh, my to, God. I have to sometimes to get names right, but that was all I was looking at, but I didn't realise it was a deceased list. <laughs> I thought it was just a names list, so I have to make sure that I click on the correct list. That's yes, all. oh, my goodness, no. It's nothing worse, because <laughs> obviously the impact of losing her is so lightened when you know it's coming. Well, not really, because I didn't realise it was going to happen then. I, I genuinely thought Sunichi was going to get to her in time. I yeah. didn't realise that that was her death. So I was like, oh, it happened really quickly. <laughs> like, we're just getting to know this character, and he's finally confided in someone, and yeah. she's dead. And you think and... he's finally got someone to talk to about this, and then there was, yeah, there was there could have been so much more. But I also feel like uh, a part of me feels like that Miggy was something to do with this in the way that Miggy could have helped quicker, but he didn't i feel like because it's very convenient that this has happened after sanichi has told kana and miggy was really upset with the fact that he'd done that or worried about his own safety and then all of a sudden kana is dead and it's like hmm i wonder if miggy could have helped a bit quicker than he actually did yeah if he could sense it earlier or be like we need to go to her now yeah exactly but or just got kana to come around to his house yeah but yeah, who knows? Miggy is a very intelligent being. Yes. Maybe he does have undertones of uh, manipulation. But yeah, so that's the end of that chapter. And we'll move on to the next one next time. Yes. And now it's time for Sagira's happy moment. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's all so sad. It is all so sad. Lizzie, what nice thing have you seen? Have you read? Have you done? A bit random, but it's nice for me. I bought myself a light box for, like, drawing art so that oh. I could, like, because obviously I don't do any digital art because it's just not for me. I like the feel, the smell, the touch and, and drawing. But this way, if I kind of make mistakes, I can use the light box. Or if I want to redraw something in a different medium, I can now practice. And I'm quite enjoying it. I've been, like, I've already, like, tested it out. It's quite nice. And it's like, oh, I could do quite a lot with this. That's cool. It's great when you get a new way of doing things and it's like, ah, but a whole new world has opened up yeah. to me in the way I can do this. So, no, it's brilliant. Um, my happy moment is, uh, oh, a new trailer came out for Fable 4, which I'm very excited about. I'm a big Fable fan. I know that it's had a lot of um, bad reviews in the past, like people did not like Fable 3. Uh, yes, it was very problematic, but I really enjoy it. It's my kind of game. I like it. 
I don't know if it's because I just go against the status quo sometimes, but I like it. And then Fable 4 is long awaited and it, the trailer looks good. I mean, it's only a tiny trailer. It's literally like a yeah. minute long. The only one I've seen is the one with the fairy flying around. That's the one. Yeah. yeah. But the, you know, the the promise of a new game is like, oh, yay. yay. <laughs> so I'm hoping that they've sorted out any of the problems that they had in the last few games. Because like, it's a new company. It's not Lionhead anymore because they broke up. But... Yeah, I'm hoping that this new company have gone, okay, well, we're keeping this about it. We're not going to change tons because otherwise it's not going to be yeah. Fable anymore. We're going to keep this from it. And we'll just change these little problematic things and that will make it a better game for yes. everyone. So I'd hoping... like more attractive men in it because all the women yeah. are like sexy wenches and I'm like, yeah, but I play gay. Like, <laughs> I, I want no, the men... boys for my pretty boy. Yeah, the men were very much, I don't know, I don't want to say ugly, but not my taste. But, no, they weren't. And I'm like... <laughs> If you're female playing it and you're like, you want to romance some guys and not romance all the women, you're a bit like, there's nothing to, it's not really much like nummies to romance. Uh, And the other one was a new Psychonauts 2 trailer came out as well. So it's my favourite game ever, Psychonauts. And it's been so many years in the making. So (laughs) the fact that a new trailer has come out and shown so much more. And also um, Jack Black sings the... uh, the um theme well not theme but the music to the trailer so i'm hoping there's more jack black in it yes very cool. excited Yay. Yay. <laughs> okay so show me da, 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 da. today i am coming in riding my noble mutant steed over a garden of flowers <laughs> looking beautiful <laughs> wouldn't nay because it's mutants and <laughs> yeah i mean no me it'll be tentacles so it'd just be <laughs> but so yes my noble mutant steed over a field of beautiful flowers i'm off to find my damsel i thought you were gonna say beautiful women <laughs> a field of beautiful, beautiful women. women i mean it could be i could ride over a field of beautiful women trying to find my one damsel that needs me amongst them a uh, field of women <laughs> My social media is coming in on my campaign bus for mayor. Hello, <laughs> yes, I can be your mayor. There's nothing weird about me. Blah, 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 blah. Nothing weird at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Say bye bye, Lizzie. So for now, this is a weeaboo saying Johnny. And from a newbie, it's. <laughs>